Queen's Gambit exchange variation could be played strategically by playing on the Queen's side, it could be played aggressively by castling opposite side, it could be played by attacking the center, and that's why it is so legendary, it has been played by so many great players. So it's finally time for us to start learning it the right way, we're going to look at the typical middle game plans, typical end games that we get out of this opening, and of course the theory so let's get started and the theory guys of course d4 d5 c4 e6 and we're ready for the exchange variation if you are already asking what if they take on c4 how do i go how do i go about it well you gotta go back guys to lesson number 50 where we covered everything once you do that come back and let's talk about how to play the exchange variation guys from here the one plan that most people know is the first one we're going to go over, which is the minority attack. So basically, we develop our pieces as so, and you could see it in this picture that I put right here. It tells you exactly where your pieces go. After bishop d3, we got knight d7, knight f3. This is where your pieces belong. Queen side bishop goes to g5. King side bishop goes to d3. The knights go to c3 and f3, very natural. And then, of course, in this case, we're going to castle to the king side. You're going to see that typically when you put the knight on f3, you're planning to go for the more strategic plan with b4, a4. When you see the knight going to e2, it's because the white pieces intend to either play with f3, so something like this. They want to play f3, e4 in the future. Or they want to play queen c2, castle to the queen side, and attack on the king side. Now let's focus on knight f3, rook e8. We finally castle. So simple to get to this position. Now from this moment on, our plan, guys, is to use the minority attack. Minority attack because we have less pawns on the queen side, and we're going to use them to create a weakness for our opponent. How? Well, if I manage to make contact on b5, take on c6, they take back. This is going to be, of course, a backward pawn, left behind pawn. We had a very short but powerful lesson on how to take advantage of such pawns. Now, in this game, you're going to see queen goes to c2, knight f8, h3, anticipating bishop g4. And then after bishop e6, the move rook a to b1 is clearly indicating I'm going to play b4 and a4. So knight e4, bishop takes, rook takes, and then pawn to b4. f5, and by the way, two things about this point in the game. Number one, if they play a6, it's not going to do much. a4 is coming anyways, and we're going to play b5 no matter what. And the other thing is that a lot of my students like this plan because typically when you attack on one flank, your opponent attacks on the other. Well, typically, it is not such a good idea. Like here, pawn to um, f5 is a pretty bad move. Number one, it creates a long-term weakness on e5. It makes this bishop a long pawn. So contrary to what many people think, what seems natural, f5, the pawn storm on the king side, it is a mistake. So instead, ideas like rook c7 give the black pieces a better chance just try to hold on on the queen side and this is very comfortable because you are making progress you're defending you don't have to worry about the king side so f5 rook, uh, rook f to c1 and guys another detail as you move up the ladder uh, you're gonna find opponents who deal better with this but up to a certain level many opponents don't really know how to handle this they think oh f5 makes sense g5 but they don't really know how to handle with this so you're gonna be doing your own thing without too much resistance. Now, if you look at the picture, again, that tells you where the pieces go. This knight typically goes to c5. The other knight many times transfers over uh, as well. So knight a4, going to c5, in front of every backward pawn, in front of every isolated pawn, there's going to be a very attractive square. So knight g6 was played, knight c5, and after queen d6, guys, forget about taking on c5 because then you might not get c6 as a weakness, but after I take back with the b pawn, b7 is going to be long-term weakness. Something like this, and that's about it. b5 is never possible because of ampersand, right? And for that reason, after knight c5, we got queen d6, then a4, rook e8, b5, pawn takes, pawn takes, 
bishop c8, and we already see how the black pieces are just passive. So we take finally, if they take with the queen, well, this is going to be the isolated weak pawn. If they take with the b pawn, backward pawn for us to put pressure on. I know that at this point in the course, all of you should know this, but I still have to say it, guys. Many of my students, when they're getting started, they get to this position, excellent execution, but then a move like this, and well, actually, yeah. So let's say we do something like, I don't know, something bad. Um, a move like this, and they take with the pawn, horrible. You want to be able to continue to drill on that pawn. Anyways, going back from this position, they took on c6, and now pay attention to how the white pieces continue from this moment on, okay? So rook b6, putting pressure on the one target, guys, the weakness that we just created. Queen f6, bishop b5, see, the pawn is pinned, we keep adding pressure. Knight g5, and now we could simply take and then collect on c6, but the white pieces prefer to play the better move, queen d1, then take, take, knight h4, queen h5, I'm going to not give my opponent any counterplay on the king side, g6, I go to h6, queen g7, and now all of you should know what the right move is, guys. Of course, we have to decide, do we want to collect the free knight or do we want to trade queens? Well, you should know we've had recent lessons where we talk about this do we want to give our opponent counterplay or go for a very easy position that we can finish after we take on c6 now we're hitting the rook isolated pawn that is going to fall sooner or later more active pieces and more importantly our opponent has no counterplay at all if we had instead collected the knight then we gotta deal with this i mean we have to be better than the black pieces but I would rather avoid any, any complications, especially if I'm in time pressure. So in this game, they took, give me the pawn, rook d8, rook b8. And guys, now pause the video and see if you can find the final move that made the black pieces resign. Of course, like always, strategy leads to tactics. The game was finished with a nice knight e6. Powerful fork and... If they collect, well, that bishop is pinned to the rook. So there you have it, guys. I'm not going to go too deep. I'm not going to give you many more examples yet because my plan is that you try these three plans I'm going to show you and then you tell me in the comments which one you like better. Then we go deeper into whatever plan you liked best. Now let's talk about the other plan where the white pieces choose to expand in the center. So here... Notice that the same thing, bishop goes to d3, but then our knight goes to e2. So this tells us they're either going to do f3 to play e4, or they're simply going to castle to the opposite side, right? So rook e8, queen c2, knight f8, castle, and after c6, we got the move pawn to f3. Again, temporarily, we're leaving this pawn a little bit weak, because f3 is not defending anymore, or the f pawn. But e4 is coming no matter what. So knight h5, we trade. Notice that this repeats over and over, right? Sooner or later, they offer us to trade bishops. We say yes, and then pawn to e4. That's it, guys. Pretty simple middle game to play now. Pawn takes, pawn takes. We've talked about the hanging pawns. We've talked about how important it is to find the right moment to advance. If we don't, we control the center very nicely. If we do advance, let's say we play e5 at some point, like, I don't know, um, something like this, we got to make sure we know what we're doing. We got to make sure it's the right timing because then weaknesses are created. Anyways, in this game, they did play, after bishop e6, they did play e5 because, yes, I'm leaving d5 available, but my knight could land on d6. And if you haven't, you guys must go over lessons 52, 123, where we talk about how to take advantage of the outpost. It's not enough to just place the knight in the outpost. We need to know what to do after. So in this case, it came in nicely, trapping the rook, queen g5, and then rook f2. Instead of just getting the rook, I'm going to use the knight to support my attack. For those of you who are new to this channel, basically what we said is getting the knight to the outpost is not enough, right? You don't win the game by just doing that. But basically, I want to pay attention to the squares that knight is controlling. In this case, I'm more interested on the ones on the king side because the king is on the king side, of course. 
and more specifically f7 now pay attention how in this game f7 happens to be crucial to win the game so after rook f2 rook e7 and now of course we want to bring the rook over but at the same time we need to pay attention to that square who's defending it can i do something about it well the bishop is doing so let me play bishop c4 and get rid of that bishop now i got queen knight rook and after 96 interfering there's a pretty nice tactic like i told you earlier when your pieces are well placed tactics are in the air guys strategically we've done a great job now we need to be looking for tactics of course we gotta calculate knight f7 pause the video if you need to to practice your ability to visualize to calculate so knight f7 was played of course if they take we take on e6 we get the knight back and we're pinning the rook, right? So queen e6, rook f8, bring more pieces to attack. And after queen e3 returning the favor, <laughs> I want you guys to, again, pause the video and let me know or at least think of what you play if you were the white pieces. Well, this is why it's so important. It doesn't matter how many openings you learn. Tactics, tactics, tactics is the most important. Here, the white pieces played g4, which is a mistake, and this is automatically equal. Instead, the simple move, guys, king h1. And now we're not pinned anymore. We're putting so much pressure on f7. Evaluation is 633 for the white pieces. So I'm going to leave it here, assuming that if you were playing this, you would play king h1. Game is over. And that way, guys, we can focus on the third plan, which is illustrated by the great Gary Kasparov. So here, knight g2 e2 as well, knight f3. They didn't play it because he's not planning on doing the minority attack. Instead, after queen c2, knight f8, he castled just like that, guys. Move number 10, castled opposite side. And we've had like four or five lessons on how to deliver this kind of attacks depending on the pawn structure our, our opponent has, right? Like in this case, they have the best one. How should we attack it? So feel free to review those lessons. Now, this is just crazy uh, whoever makes contact first should win and i'm not going to show you the remaining of the game because every single game that i've shown you it is in the description i left the link for you to, re to review the entire games but basically guys f3 to play g4 typical pawn storm to attack on the king side of course we're going to be attacked as well so that's why it's so important that we review multiple games understand the ideas and of course that we're going to do together if you let me know in the comments that this is the plan that you like if i see that there's more inclination towards another plan we focus on that other plan so there you have it three typical middle game plans i have this book that we're going to go over as well guys is basically tactics from this opening and of course then we're going to talk about the typical end games and review master games as well with that said I trust that you're going to communicate with me in the comments and I will see you in our next lesson.